It's great to see everyone. We're happy to be here with our launch. And uh, this is looking good. There's Barbara Rosenthal on the back cover. There's my self-portrait on the front cover, the ring master. But it's fun to work with all of you talented people and uh, acrobats and uh, gymnasts of words and linguists extraordinaire from far and near. Um, and I, I, you know, it's like such a community. I look and I see Bob here, Bob Heeman. And, you know, Bob was the first guy to publish me in New York. And, um, and uh, it's great to, to keep on doing this stuff and be inspired by each other, you know, and be able to keep doing it here. And now we have uh, the Hudson Park Library in Tompkins Square with Emil and Aliona helping us so much to get this thing going. And today we're going to start off a little bit um just with a couple of announcements i know sanjay has a couple of readings coming up he's got one next sunday and it's a funny kind of deja vu we think because sanjay has been doing this on sunday afternoons for so long that i kind of feel like i'm at the park side or something i keep thinking it's sunday you know so uh he's got something up next sunday with uh marat and um peter valente going to be talking about art and stuff they have in local knowledge and jim Ruggia, i was talking about in the green room there He's got, uh, he's hooking us up for a broadside backrooms local. He, you know, he thinks of us as a triangle, which is nice. And he's got live mag coming up in uh, May. And, uh, and in uh, April, which is very soon, he's also got Chris Krauss reading with Peter Valente and art by Barbara Rosenthal in that one. And also announcements here, Greg has just got a nice review for collabs that Sparrow, the great Sparrow wrote. And Sarah Sarai always has 10 things going on. Nice to see you. And there's Jessica Nissen and she's in this issue too. We'll be looking at this art later as we go through. And in fact, let's look at the art now without further ado, if we could, Laura, if you wanna start the art show, these are just some of the samples from the issue issue and here's marina this is ilka's great find marina is a great artist who's showing at salon 94 and uh, she shows internationally in italy and england and she's married to the also great artist stanley whitney who i think is now a kagosian and they're in local downtown lower east side people terrific whoops there's Pablo. Pablo De, uh, Delano is uh, out. His roots are in Cuba and- um, uh, Puerto Rico. <laughs> I'm sorry, Puerto Rico. But he, he travels to Trinidad and Tobago. This one is from photographs all over. He teaches at Trinity. And then Ula. Ula Einstein, some of us have known for a, quite a while, East Village, longtime resident. Um, and she did this technique with putting words on these eggshells. She did many kinds of textual things. Um, Swiss kind of a cousin of Ava Hess in a, in a metaphorical way. Patricia Fabricant. Um, Lori's these Lori has so many friends in the art world that when we met and started going out in uh, Green uh, Greenpoint and Williamsburg mostly, we met such a huge array of, of artists and all. So it's great to have Patricia in this issue. And there's Linda Griggs. And uh, Linda was on the show a couple of times ago. She does these fabulous um, walnut ink and uh, sort of very uh, thought out kinds of series and centers on meaningful things. Garden of the Gods, beautiful rendition. Doing a lot of stuff over at Clemente, Linda is. And there's Carl, Carl Hazelwood from uh, show down at uh, June Kelly. And as Patricia pointed out, the last time Patricia and I were in touch was at Carl's opening, which was a wonderful occasion. And let's do Bob Heeman as a preview and then just stop here and then move on to the reading. So this is what we'll be seeing. We're gonna do two, two readers 
then Bob's gonna the presentation and then the last two readers and the puppet chat. So let me, uh, thank you, Lori, for putting that together. Yay, the artists and the issue. And thank you everybody again for coming today on this beautiful spring day. <laughs> I hope you've been out, get back out. Um, so Patricia um, Spears Jones is quite an accomplished uh, writer and artist, and it's, it's, she's been a great friend for a long time. And um, uh, we, to our, our main connections were like the tribes and the Cauldron of St. Mark's, and we were right there working together. And I appreciated she was from Arkansas and I was from West Virginia. And then here we were with all these people. And uh, I, I was just playing with uh, what I think of some of her stuff. And I thought of these words like exotic and quixotic, exotic, but down home and, and quixotic and direct and pertinent and even impertinent, but ever real, generous and tough. And, and her work is it's anchored and true. And her images are like the hallmark of a great writer. They're just, she's, she's like a hammer on the nail kind of image worker. Her work is, and it is a blessing and a joy to have Patricia here. Let's please welcome her reading. Thank you, um, Jeffrey, that was exotic. Well, okay. <laughs> I am so pleased to do this and I'm glad to be in the issue. And I'm not gonna read a lot of stuff, but I'm gonna read some things that I think are pertinent. Uh, we're in the first 100 days of, you know, a new administration. And I wrote uh, for Rachel Zucker's anthology back in 2009 for uh, Obama's first 100 days. I think I got day 55 or something. And on that day, some guy killed his family in the South. And one guy jumped off, jumped into the Niagara Falls. The epigram, Niagara, uh, and this is in my book. Okay. Uh, uh, a loose fire. Okay, Niagara Falls, Niagara Parks Police Chief Doug Kane said the man quote voluntarily entered into the water and refused medical assistance at the bottom. Unquote. What the fates allow. One. Sometimes. A plunge is a plunge. Depending on time of day, sleeplessness repeated, seeking bottom. The world is fabric unraveling, thread by thread. And Clotho and her sisters appear to be on strike. Enough, you despoilers of our hearts, consumers of our children, disbelievers and betrayers of health. We won't help you anymore. So they sit chatting about how the rainbows used to be prettier and why the old gods are so useless nowadays. And while one man refuses rescue in the North, another murders kith and kin in the South, Aisha said. Waterfalls are fiercer than we imagine. Family bonds weaker than connect conventions desire. These voluntary moments of desperation, that mayhem on a sunny day in the sunny South, mirror our media's advertisement for, quote, domestic abuse, unquote. The boyfriend's vaguely contrite, the girlfriend nowhere in sight, should she return? Should he go to jail? Duet recorded is soon to be released. Meanwhile, teenage girls are beaten daily leading to a brisk business at Cosmetic Empire. Two, our continent's resources were so abundant. Many nations thrived, even, a newly, even as newly arrived Europeans sacked temples and released horses, pigs, changing travel, topography, the hunting rights, so carefully negotiated. Fevers, deaths, the quest for more land, more gold, an old story made young again in the glass wall structures of ravenous plutocrats. How this experiment in democracy 
became formidable and was almost lost in the dust and quiver of towers dashed, a crisis fraught for the corrupted pleasure of a Shakespeare reality show, which unfortunately we got later on. It goes to this. A Shakespeare reality show, Hal to Henry, but no false step, leaving us with this moment of scarcity, anxiety, and change, making some of us giddy and hopeful. No president, no matter his heart, strength, and his mind's obsidian edge can do what we all must do. Seek Lacasis wisdom, beg the spinner's forgiveness, offer up our desire for a world made whole with threads from a stronger, more flexible fabric, illuminated our future shared differently. And that, thank you, that was, uh, it was interesting to write that because I was looking at it again and went like, dang, that keeps coming up over and over again. And unfortunately we did have the Shakespeare reality show. Ah! Yeah. All right. Um, Many of you on this uh, here knew Esther Louise, uh, who was a wonderful poet and who at one, one point had been married to Willie Birch and is the mother of Amma Birch. Uh, and unfortunately she left us a few years ago by her own hand. But before she left, she left a whole lot of some wild stuff. And this is a, based on a conversation I had with her. Half Moon Sky. And Swimming to America, which is totally out of print, but it's a beautiful book. Thank you, Janet Kaplan. Esther Louise and I were talking about Janice Joplin. We were talking about how Janice Joplin sang as if she found a pain so wide it wounded her. She sang loud and hard, but the wound was big. The wound would not heal. She sang as if nothing, nothing could cauterize that wound. She sang as if only, only she knew the way to heal the world, to heal this wound was to burn. Daily dousing flames from her throat, daily striking matches to her mouth. She sang as, as if the only, only way she could make her face remove every trace of plainness was to burn, burn, and burn. She sang so hard and long and loud, she came as close as she could to the pain of those songs made in boxcars, to joints, outside vaudeville hip homes, to deviants, to generous, and a generous family of hustlers, some of them women torched by the freedom of the road. Oh, yes, Esther Louise said, that white girl can sing the blues. Janice sang as if only, only she could sweep away dry Texas air and burn out like a nova, leaving traces of wild hair, Indian bracelets all the way up her arm, her neck wrapped in layers of beads from Persia, beads from Navajo land, beads from West Africa. When I first saw Intazaki Shange, I thought Janice. <laughs> and I and a couple of more. Now, the artwork is gorgeous, by the way. I just want to throw that out. All right. So um, last year, I did um, a really odd poem called Flame. Um, I don't often write about climate change and stuff, but this came up. And this is for everybody who ever read Sarah Teasdale's There Will Come Soft Rains, which is a great poem. And of course, the great Ray Barrett Bradbury short story that uses There Will Come Soft Rain in it. Flame. Remembering the river burning near Pittsburgh, yes, near Pittsburgh, and then meeting poets, poets from Pittsburgh who said the air was the color of chalk. Talk of climate disruption is as old as that story, more than 50 years ago, and now. There are glaciers melting faster than the river burns. Nostalgia is dangerous. 
that burning, burning river spark began many years before the flames burst free. Those good old days were not all that good, but the beer was cheap and so were the lives of working people. The children of the people who lived near the burning river now work in tech or hospitals or hotels and resorts. Their hands are dipped in different chemicals, but the flare for destruction lingers, a smoky reminder of industrial waste. Saving this planet is decades old, so old that children now scream at those who bank the blame. Are we sparking our own mass destruction, mass extinction? Or have marching children lit a different, more ardent fire? How the planet's wind spread fire is up to humans commanding combustion. Oh, fools and bumblers, hesitate this moment and those bunkers built way, way down will spin into that Ray Bradbury story whose title comes from Sarah Teasdale's anti-war poem with but one reference to claim. Earlier this year, Lee Brewer, who was the co-founder, one of the co-founders of Mabu Mines, finally died after a long illness. And I came to the East Village and worked with Mabu Mines. And uh, so uh, this was written literally on the spur of the spur of. Lee Brewer dies at clean my stove. Uh, the clove in this is Clove Galilee, his daughter. Clove calls me at 10 a.m. or so. She lives in California. Her voice is rumbling, sad volume. You should know that Lee is in hospice. I did not know that Lee is in hospice. She says she had time to sit and talk to her. Her brothers had time to sit and talk to their father. What a luxury. A break from distance, place between the living and the dying. Those pandemic built walls, but this is cancer. This is organ failure. This is old age, this dying. Thus, the family makes traditional gestures for an unconventional man. His muses living and dead most likely shout him quiet. And the fast talking man is who sparks your path is always a matter of fortune. Good fortune and light remains lit no matter the brambles. Bad and all is shadow and stumble and loss. Oh, fortune for me was good and I cleaned my stove. The old stove's top has aged things and boiling over pot stories and memories of landing feet first in the muck of art making. Every memory of pebbles, stone, rock of learning. Lions die in quiet, or in roar. Lions die. That light moves to one more, and one more, and more. Pilot light. Yes, the pilot light. And then I'll end with uh, this very strange dream. Thank you, Jeff, for publishing this. And it's also up on the Gathering of Tribes uh, website as well. Steve Cannon, uh, who I knew from like 1975 on, uh, was a big uh, person in my life and clearly in my psyche. Walking on Avenue A on the Tompkins Square Park side. And again, thank you, Live Magazine. Now you laugh. I think Steve would be laughing if he actually heard this poem. Okay. We are walking, oh, and Sandra Payne, who's a wonderful artist, who I hope someday you'll have in your pages, uh, is also in this. We are walking, Sandra Payne and me, on, on an unpeopled Avenue A. It is dark, but nobody's, I'm looking on my screen and seeing somebody standing up in their kitchen. It's really weird. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <clears throat> walking on Avenue A, on the Tompkins Square Park side. We were walking, Sandra Payne and me, on the unpeopled Avenue A. It is bar dark, but too dark, and even in daytime, it's dark. Okay. 
It is dark, but too dark, and even in the daytime, it's dark on Avenue A. We walk on the sidewalk on the Tompkins Square Park side. No dog. We see Steve Cannon driving a sedan. He rolls down his window. Want a ride? Sandra waves no, but I say, hey, he may be going further. So we go over to where he is parking his car. It's 7th Street. He parallel parks on Avenue A and 7th Street so the garage man can check his car. This is the unblind Steve, the unglassed Steve. His eyes bright brown, but what is strange is his hair. He has too much straight black hair. It's a wig, a sort of bad beetles cut with bangs. Steve Cannon with bangs. He's smiling, but the hair. It's post-chemo wig hair. It's the worst haircut you've ever had and must cover it up wig hair. Steve had that New Orleans mess with me hair. The wig is a rebuke of all that New Orleans play. Steve smiles, patient with the garage man. His ride is a Volvo. It's roomy and safe, and he salutes Sandra and me, and we salute him back, and then the dream. Yay, Patricia. Thank, Thank you, you so beautiful. much. Hi, you know, I, I meant to say something actually at the beginning. I sort of stopped right in the middle. I wanted to mention a couple of your books like The Lucent Fire and these older ones like Request Us and Living in the Love Economy. And, and also say that your work, you know, you, you, you can go from the elegy to the brawl. You could be a brawler. And you're wise, powerful, and right. And your quote, come unity, come unity. And I just wanted to read this slight quote from your book. We will gather the gloom of this time and wrap it in a cloth of deep memory. We must care enough to claim this anguish and use it. Not actually from your book, but from your poems. But it was about the COVID thing. We have to use it. And with this being the COVID issue and all that. So thanks again, Patricia. You're welcome. It was great. I'm looking forward to everybody else. All right. Happy to see you. So our next guest is Paco Marquez. And uh, he's, uh, I was going to lie and say he's a musician. But actually, when I Googled him, he is a musician. But there is our Paco, Paco Marquez, Marquez, right? Our Paco Marquez, he's actually, um, he escaped from the Garden of Neruda on a moonlit night uh, and, and escaped to the Pacific. And uh, he spent most of his life out there chasing mermaids. He, and he's, uh, I think of his work as, a, as sort of a mystic, mystic impressionist work. It's just beautiful and lush. And uh, his book is um, Self-Portrait in G Minor. And uh, we're lucky to have him in this issue. It's just a beautiful poem in here called Blue. And let's hear it for Mr. Paco Marquez. Hello, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for hosting and for publishing Live Mag and for everything you do in R. And thank you, Patricia, Larry, and Lydia for reading. I look forward to the days when we can get together after the readings and chat and get to know each other a little better in person. So I'm going to kick off my reading with a poem by a poet from Madagascar, uh, Eugene Joseph Robert Barriello. I discovered him at Poet's House, just walking around. And this, I really like is this book, Translated from the Night. Uh, and so I'm just going to read one of his poets, poems. You delude yourself. You who don the air of a little bird astray in a snowy forest that reaches as far as the breast of the gore of Whitman and James, who replace the Christ hanging over your bed, since it isn't the oldness of the world nor that of day so many thousands of times over which caresses now its beard white and thick as oblivion, like hope and like the haze of torrid mornings over there above all the mountains 
an astrologer consulting the stars and smoking a clay pipe. It is youth. Oh, my child, it is eternal youth, metamorphosis, perhaps by the grace of songs of the poets you prefer, who create a religion for you, which in this silence without end, people with columns and streams, the living and the dead. It is no more than the shadow of all things past, and here's nothing but the soul present. So that's Jean Joseph. And for my first poem, I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, let me see. I don't know if Lori, you can do it or I can try it. There we go. Cross out the stars tonight. Mark them as blue asterisks. Erase the moon behind the skyscraper. Replace it with a question mark. Each living being, mom with stroller, pigeons overhead, an exclamation mark. The colon is reason, the period taught. Past the ellipses, an armadillo and a wasp trapped in a glass jar are an armadillo and a wasp in a jar. Past the ellipses, in the blank white page lie the smoldering ruins of Native Americans, conquistadors and Puritans could not see. When the eye departs from the mark to the ink, into the desk, window, cities hum, past the symbol world, a quiet boy waves back. Do you see me? He asks. This next one is called uh, Pause, where silence itself was the sign of the communion of souls, Gaston Bachelard. I sit still, listening to a red carnation's dots, the sweet nothing half of everything held in a bodily pause. Silence sits behind me, puts on a mask drinks air from a light blue porcelain cup. Carnations, apples, lilacs float on a flat river. A hallucinatory whisper, an arbitrary amulet, add the ear's emptiness to the star's throb. And this next one, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read one poem from my book, Portraits in G Minor. Uh, it's a cool breeze. I say that which spoke the rose into being is here with me now. You say, cut the bull. I say, there have always been two gods, the artificial one, a psychological future, and the natural one of typhoons and stars. You say, Snoopy probably ponders that when he lays on top of his dog house. I, there is no future, no past, no present. Human decay is the unknown eating ripe bodies and meditative brilliant alertness is the sky snuggling on muddy soil. Green balloons lifting rusted train wheels, rays of slow light, children eaten. You hold my hand, look me in the eye and say, the kitchen window is open. And don't forget, we're meeting Liz for dinner tonight. And I don't have a lot more, maybe just a couple more. Um, I need to I'll do this one raw. Peppermint salamander, cross up my neck. I relax into the ocean conversation of a breeze warm as seen popcorn at the movie theater eaten by raspberry lips. We crawl out the window and lay on the lawn, eating weeds like cows that didn't graze in the avenue, five street lights behind us. Light bulb shining midday, around which flies a Norwegian fly. You read me a comic the wind blew on my jeans and tell me all animals see the same beauty you saw speaking through your blade of grass. 
Uh, let's try just one last one. Jeff for hosting. The surfer under the clouds shadow glides an invisible summit mile high mile high miles wide inverse iceberg of your mother's tongue her first whisper your own future last the heart tamer serves the summit stop the hermaphrodite knows how to love herself so that when fear screams itself into the mind heart of the human, she, he, he, she lands, lands atop the cloud with music played backwards in time. Butterflies everywhere, butterflies all around, ephemeral evaporation, clear sky. Thank you. All right, Paco. You know, when I said that about Neruda, I was like sort of right off your bio. You were involved with Neruda stuff. And oh, I love the Neruda idea of floating in the ocean. <laughs> that was beautiful. Yeah. And don't forget, dinner at seven with Liz. <laughs> what a <laughs> line to throw in a poem. How great. Thank you, Paco. That was wonderful, guys. Paco Marquez. Yes, sir. And now this issue is so great. Now we're going to, I dropped it on the floor here. Now. We're going to look at a few more of the artworks that are in the other side of the book. And I think that's what we're going to do. Here we go. Yes, walking on Avenue A with a wild haircut, New Orleans style tossed down. Uh, keep going. Oh, wow, where's all the artists in this issue? Jessica. Jessica, here we go. Jessica Nissen, this is great. It's so fun when you look on Facebook and see who you're friends with. And um, Jessica's friends with um, Colette and uh, Simone de Beauvoir and uh, oh, blanking on the other name. Oh, well. But I love this piece, Cloud Lick. Okay, Helen OG, we had in our last performance and we had a wonderful talk helen's here jessica's here hi 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 i love this piece carolina Prolato, my next to last opening i went to this has got a lot of texture when you get up right close you can feel the paint just thick on there it's really fun slider this is barbara rosenthal and uh she's also uh going to be showing some more art with uh, local knowledge on the 11th, I believe. Sanjay, can you put that in the chat? Boss man. David Rosenbaum, really wonderful guy. Um, he does these, you can see what they are. They're really fun stuff there. Uh, always good to see David around too. Lawrence Swan, as the empire collapses. And that's it for the art in this issue, uh, except for Willie Birch is in a different section. So let's go on now and look at um, uh, Bob Heeman's uh, collages. Now, Bob is a poet and uh, he's, he does uh, information, amazing series for years. He's, he's also a publisher. I, I said my first poems were in Clown Wars. And, uh, but he's also been doing collage all this time and he, he comes from that place like uh, Kayak Magazine used to have those wonderful collages, sort of a uh, McGree style. And here we go. And Bob, are you unmuted now? Yes, I am. Okay, man. Okay. Um, this one is from 2006. And it was a period, I first started doing collages when I was in college in the 60s, late 60s. And then in the 70s, I did different art, drawings and cutouts. In the 80s, I started doing collages again, but they were always black and white and they were usually line art. So I could reproduce them in my magazine, in other people's magazines. And this was one of those. Um, if you go to the next, 
piece um, when actually Jeff, when you and Valerie invited me to be in a group collage show, I, for the first time, I decided to do color. I felt like I had to do color. It was the first time in 40 years I had done color. And this was one of the pieces in, the, in that show. And with this and with some pieces I did for a show at Safety Gallery, a group show at Safety Gallery, I started working mostly in color. Uh, if you want to move on to an, another, the next one. This is called Straying from the, Her Straying from the Herd. And it's from 2017. And it also has something I like to, I like repetitive images. I like mm -hmm. using repetitive images. And that's basically all this is, is repetitive images. And also probably the most environmentally aware piece I've ever done. Um, okay, so move, move on to the next. This is called The Apparition. This was actually done in 2020. And for the first time, I started using black and white and color in the same collages, which yeah, I hadn't really done cool. before. And so th this is, was a, I have worked on this for a long time, just getting the, the background, the bulk of the horizontal with the buildings and the trees and the walkway. And it came together when I finally added this apparition. It almost looks um, Photoshopped there. No, nothing. Everything I do is cut and paste. And I, have, I have hundreds of folders full of images waiting to be collaged. I mean, so many. You've anyway. Got images. You've got great images, particularly your antique ones. Thank you. This is from my arrival series, which is the same series that the one in the current live mag is from. I did, I think 44 of them um, a few years ago. They're all black and white. For the first time, I used a lot of grayscale images rather than line art. And they're all, you know, fit on a no larger than eight, eight and a half by 11, say, or nine by 12. And they went all over the place. Okay, this next one is from my postcard series. I started going to postcard shows and buying from the quarter boxes old postcards from the first two decades of the 20th century. And all kinds of interesting things. The one thing with using old postcards is you, you see the line edges because the card stock is thick. So when you cut them, you and it doesn't the the seams show, but that's okay. That's part of what they are. Um, this one actually is downtown. That one was downtown Brooklyn, a long time ago. Um, okay, this is another cutout, uh, another collage one. But it's a bit different in that it's horizontal and the lines don't really show, and it has different pieces from different places coming together into sort of a very strange little microcosm. Well, Esther-like almost. Yeah. The cloister looks Italian. Probably. And mm -hmm. the person in the cage is actually a sculpture from someplace, I forget where, I have the little scrap of the card still, but, but it looks like a person in the cage. This was the spite house. The, the house there was a spite house. It was built during a property dispute. So only half of the house could be there. Uh -huh. And the river, and yeah, it just all fit together in a way I really liked. Okay, next. This actually was done for a project that Alan Bealey put together, where he invited 26 collage artists, including Jeff actually, to each do a collage that went with the letter of the alphabet, because the book had 26 very small little poems with the letter from the letters of the alphabet. And I, I had I, X. I absolutely love this one. I had uh, the letter P 
and I, I drew a picture of Pegasus. Right. Oh, I remember okay. that. One. Yeah. Okay. So, but this I was X. Oh, okay. Oh, this is this crazy. is a cover of my friend Alex Caldiero's most recent book. He's actually in the audience here, from all the way from Utah. So. And, but this was a cover I did for his book. It's another one where I combined black and white with color. And it's one of a lot, I, I like doing covers. I've done a lot of covers for all kinds of people, um, including a number of the people here in the audience. Um, Cindy Hockman, Karen Newberg, Evie Ivey, I've done David, a uh, cover for a book of David Mills. I've done all kinds of different covers. And- Okay, that's great. That'd be a great cover. So, so wow. this is a cover of Alex's new book. And that pretty much, I think we've gone through the whole slideshow. All right, Bob, that was quite a treat. And we were in another show together out there at Brooklyn. Um, Steve Dalchinsky was in it with us, with Yuko out there. CCP Gallery. Were you in that one? Uh, I don't remember. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dumbo. Okay, All right. That, that was that was one that. Re oh yeah, safety gallery. Yeah. Safety. No, there was a different. Oh, maybe it was safety. Yeah. All well, right. It was a cool. one to, a one shot one night thing. Yeah, one night we were showing slides. Yeah, yeah that it was, was fun. My first time I was there. Yeah. Um, but I also had a had pieces in the show of tribes, which you were at also. Yeah, yeah. Bruce that Bruce did. That's right. Yeah. A poet collage artist syndrome. Oh. <laughs> okay, Bob Heeman, thank you, sir. Thank you for having me. You got it, man. All right. Now, it gives, uh, I, I love this guy's work. Larry Sawyer, he is uh, just everything you want in uh, new American writing. He's like a Cadillac, a galactic Cadillac in a pool hall. He's like got the freestyle hot hypertext down. He's got, uh, I wanted to read a little quote here from David Shapiro about um, Larry's work uh, for one of his books. And also he did the myopic series in Chicago and he ran Milk Mag, published people like Robert Creeley. This is what our friend David said about uh, Larry's first collection called Of Unable to Fully California. I fell in love with your blue fruit and inescapable tomorrow. Also what seems like renunciation, not of sentimentality, but of cliche. I like even the quasi romantic dislocation here. And I love the quasi romantic dislocation here. Let's hear it for Larry Sawyer. Larry, have fun. Thank you so much, Jeff, for inviting me. And I'm so happy to read today with Patricia, Bob, uh, Paco, with Lydia. Uh, thanks to everyone attending. Um, it's an honor. And uh, I haven't read in a little while. I read uh, here in Toronto for Ryerson University uh, with uh, Lena Vitkowskis and Dale Smith just recently. So um, hopefully that got, got me back into it. I've been in Toronto since June, so we moved here. Um, knee deep in the pandemic, which was weird. But um, I'm happy uh, with where we landed. Toronto's great. I um, thought I'd read uh, a few poems from the book that Jeff referenced, and then I'll move on to my, um, my most recent book is Daylight Hammer, which I just published a few months ago. I was actually published in Clown War as an infant. So, um, Whatever I sent you, Bob, way back when, I don't know when that was, it must have been like 1994 or something, but um, I wanna say that was like one of my first poetry publications, so thank you for that. Um, this poem is called Miracle of Apples. Someday the apples will be liberated, the pear will start a revolution, and the banana will commit suicide rather than be executed. In tense meetings, the cantaloupe has come up with a new political system. It exists at the center of an ovoid universe on a long summer afternoon. You dream of secret conversations that drip with sticky pink juice. Yesterday, the pomegranate gave a speech and received a rousing ovation, but at midnight, patrols of vegetables rode through town, plastering posters of the banana on every available wall. Grapes everywhere were deceived into joining the knives, forks, dishes, mugs, and even a glass of wine. Now dinner has descended upon me, 
They will lead me to my ordinary death as real as the breath of a cannibal. So I, I've been inspired by much over the years, um, but namely and earliest by that anthology of New York poets published by uh, David Shapiro. Um, so as a, you know, geez, as a 17 year old or something growing up in Fairborn, Ohio, um, that oh, book was a revelation for me. Um, and so as a result, um, I, I use a lot of collage techniques in my work and also uh, some found language, language as well, occasionally. Um, this is called a uh, Velocissimo. I thought Snoopy was mentioned earlier, so I'll read this. It's about uh, Archie and Jughead and Reggie and Veronica. Reggie and Veronica will always be together on that blueberry hill of history. But what was gained by Jughead's expiation? No matter what he does, he fails head first. Archie's head is as red as a fireplace, and after seeing Veronica's new skirt, he's in a haze. Mr. Lodge is always the bearer of bad tidings, and Midge told Moose about Reggie's advances. Coach Cleats wants Archie at practice, but circumstances dictate that he has to run from Betty in hot pursuit. Archie's sweater, thank God, is intact, and city girls do await him at college, but for now, no words can describe Jughead's mystifying grammar. And what of Moose, all powerful and menacing? Uh-oh, uh-oh, we're in a submarine now. What's going on? Who's got their unmute on, unmuted? Please fix it. There we go. Fixed. Sorry. That's okay. So this one's called Inside the Waves. I wrote this for Lena Vitkowskis, my wife. She was the last can of soup. Her steaming metal poured along the late afternoon streets into the dirty gutters, across the boulevards, the avenues, the promenades. And down at the track, they placed bets on her brood, as in her veins, the tomato soup hot as blood poured. She ate the soup as if it were the food of the gods. She crossed the street, dragging down the sun. Pizza parlors closed one after another in her wake. She called from a great distance inside the waves, her hair holding seahorses and starfish, her arms green with the brine of millennia. As if the evening could understand that the formula of DNA that dripped from her eyes. She knew that no one would ever understand that the food of her flesh was something that no man could ever do without and silences that boiled over like hurricanes. No one survived her misunderstood sentences. None could take their eyes off her, steam rising from every manhole in the city that children rebuild every night in her sands. I just have a few more. And I'm so thankful that it's almost 50 degrees in Toronto right now, so. Uh, Lena says you should mention the Celsius. So yeah, we'll, we'll be waiting on that one for a minute. I have to whip out my calculator. To... When it's zero, I guess that's good here. So um, I'm still acclimating. This poem is called Beauty and Truth. No one talks to that elderly couple anymore, but they still sit in the park feeding envy breadcrumbs. You see to grow to that age and he can still Alejandro and she is still holding some cosmos enraptured in her eyes. Look while they shuffle off, having been the center of attention for ages. So I might just read about two more. Um, this is titled ba Baby Devils. This actually was published in Live Magazine. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Baby Devils. Unattributed feelings sprout. Yes, you know it well how they shout inside. These shop-worn hooks. It's midnight in the laundromat and the looks you sometimes get. The projectionist wants science fiction, but people just want presidents. My beef with body doubles, how they resent direction, you know they really want the lead. I mourn surface tension, it's sloppy assault on the senses. Put this in parentheses, that all my words, those baby devils, part like daffodils at the first sign of attention and for all their flighty nonchalance, act untoward. 
So I think I have two more pretty short ones. Uh, once again, thanks so much to Live Mag and New York Public Library, and thank you everyone for making this happen. This one's titled Everyday Greatness. Look, they stretch off into the distance, the woods that surround me, endless hills. In the hollow log of my mother, I hide from myself. Listen to the echoes, their shoes. I swore I heard my son. Listen, I hope we can catch sight of ourselves. Now I see my other relatives, an old fence, bushes, fields without crops. How did this old road without end become my sister? And I'll read one more. This is the last poem in my book called uh, Daylight Hammer. Um, it's available on the terrible Amazon, but also um, Barnes and Noble as well. So other forces, other fields. A shadow at twilight, a heartbeat in time to flapping wings. A solitary bat rings the upper branches of a dis disapproving tree. Keep to the path as you enter the woods. We will survive and hope is our food. A spider sits, a lone bird moans, and night's black zodiac dances. Memory is a landscape, but blindfolded over the eyes. Everybody rise. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right, that was beautiful. Larry Sawyer. All right, Larry. Thanks, Jeff. Terrific, man. All right, we're going to move right on now to Miss Lydia Cortez. And uh, when I reviewed Lydia's book a while back, uh, one of her books, um, I said something about she should be on the stamp already. And uh, just wanted to mention a couple of things here about one of her books is called Lust for Lust, uh, which tells you a lot. And she's a sassy, salsa-centric philosopher, troubadour, a rich witness, self-disclosing self -disclosing lady. Now, to quote this other guy, it's just brilliant. This guy, Uriwin Noel, I don't know if I'm saying his name right, probably not. Her, from his column in Harriet, he said, she wears it, wears its, his, her poems, Lydia Cortez's poems, wears its OG Boricua heart on its post beat sleeve, punk feminist question mark. Let's please welcome Miss Lydia Cortez. Thank you, Maestro Jeffrito. Thank you for having invited me. This is a real pleasure to be here with these wonderful poets, Patricia, Paco, and Larry. It's my pleasure to be here. I have two poems for you. I've been working on a book about Pedro Pietri. And uh, so this will be one of the poems in the book. Pedro, to Pedro Pietri, traffic misinterpreter, misinterpietri, the reverendo. After Pedro's poem, Traffic Misdirector, written in tribute to Jorge Brandon, Puerto Rican street poeta y declamador, who carried his belongings around in a shopping cart on the Lower East Side and was rarely found without his half pint caneca of Don Gu. The greatest second living poet in New York City came to be and not be born in Ponce, port of rich, but evermore of poor. His name is Pedro Pietri Spiro Reverendo. He is his own exaggerated and most underrated of metaphors, bearing crosses nailed crisscrossed with condoms, bearing also a black briefcase, huge white letter, Reverend Pedro glued to its sides, filled with poems typed on tiny manila envelopes, usually used for Mari y Juana. On his, he printed his Poems on the outside, on the inside, one always found a condom. He'd hock them on the street, in a subway, 
and so high rise church are sacred mother of the tomatoes in la plaza de manhattan on 43rd street saying man if you don't like the poetry think of this you're spending a buck for a safe fuck what's more he carried a begging can that once carried bustelo now covered with black paper and white masking tape letters proclaiming, help me, I can see. In Manhattan y en Puerto Rico, in Nicaragua or Europa, he was way above, way out of sight, far out, he hovers still. I can feel him declamando siempre, he will be and whoever cares to listen or not listen, he'll always speak with claridad. This native born boy de la playa de Ponce from whence came also Doña la Negra, la bomba y la plena. They heard him on Spanish Harlem Street corners in the East 105th Street Family Church, where he joined the young lords to protest injustice inside and out. Y por si acaso, he also invented his own iglesia, la madre de los tomates, la poesía suya, functioning as one poesy truth telling for all the poor and even some rich below 96th street and stages of broadway's great white ways and in studios of hollowed wood were too depraved and so duly deprived of his sabiduría only a little did he come to be known fuera de su gente though some like jose ferrer jose pap Raul Julia and even Paul the Simon sang his praises, almost immortalized our very own Reverendo Pedro. But now you have to hang out in other spheres. You'll still find our Pedro Juan, the only one, el único, like Jorge Brandon. Pedro's own chosen greatest living poet on Rufo's escaped fires in the Havarras on tenement stoops in parques, bodegas, botanicas, iglesias, y quizás en alguna sinagoga, pawn shops, card games, cockfights, funeral parlors, Valencia bakeries, Hunts Point palaces, y pools, and Orchard Street, and Orchard Beach, and Gucci Frito stands on Loisaida, which now has become upper. The admission to his shows was casi siempre free. Su presencia finally made the news, and even the New York Times, with his obit, albeit in the Saturday edition. Su grandísima presencia, el reverendo Pedro. His presence is poetry por siempre y amen. And this is a very short poem and I dedicate it to all my male friends. The title comes from a Costa Rican poet and playwright named Eunice Odio from a play of hers comes uh, called The Fire's Journey. And the title is this beautiful line from her play. I went to the sea for oranges, a thing the sea doesn't have. I went to some Latino guy poets to see about the place of the ladies. A thing these Latino guy poets don't have. That's why I call some Latino guy poets macho bitches. 
Thank you. Oh, Thank wow, you. Lydia, that was awesome. Love your last line, Lydia. It's a classic. <laughs> you really Thank nailed you. Pedro's voice too, that in there. That was great stuff, great stuff. Um, well, Thank you. we're going to now um, just go straight, just a brief thing. Oh yes, whenever I did these puppet shows for my um, granddaughter, I always started off like with a little talk and then uh, I put on my fun hat and she would run and grab a, a hat. So before we start this, this is a project I did uh, in the beginning of the early part of the pandemic. So I hope you enjoy it and we'll say goodbye on the other end. Here we go, the Rufus Show. Oh, there's supposed to be some music here. Lori, unmute yourself and start it again, would you please? Can you? Oh, Mrs. Mouse. This is my son helped me put this together. This was his idea to put these words in here. Let's try this. Yeah. I am a Rufus and I I'm bad. I'm going to visit my friend. Coming. Oh, your eyes so big. Oh, wow, there's a feather coming out of your nose. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what happened to Jeffy. <laughs>
Kim is a kiss in love. Everybody's coming to my house, baby. I'm never gonna be Oh, well, thank you so much. Thank you to everybody. Look at these people who gave me puppets, so many of them. Almost all of my puppets were given to me. I have like over two dozen now. My brother who made the castle, Norma with some paper dolls. This was, this production, this uh, YouTube produced, showing it here, it's, it's better actually on YouTube. It's not as jumpy, the timing's better and stuff. Thank you, Lori, for doing all that, putting up that today and putting up all our artwork. Oh, thank you so much. Yay. Yay, team. What a team we are, huh? Live match.